Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming to today's Beyond the Scope. Um, today, we're going to have a talk by Sarah McCoolett. Um, she's the lab manager at CMS. Uh, she takes care of a lot of um, safety and also lab management and also gets some time on the instruments as well. Um, she started here oh, less than a year ago, so she's fairly new, but she has a ton of experience with doing a lot of um, bio sample prep, which I found extremely useful, um, and also has EM experience in the SEM and TEM realm. So she has quite a bit of experience in all of this. Um, one thing I want to mention about the seminar itself is it's pre-recorded, but Sarah is present. Um, she had some internet issues, so we decided to record it ahead of time. But she'll be around afterwards to answer your questions as well. Um, I also want to mention that we did fill out a, we sent out a survey this last week. Um, if you have time, could you please fill that out? It's going to be really useful to get our um, seminar to be as useful for as many people as possible. Um, so again, about this webinar, we're going to be talking about high pressure freezing preparation for biological sample preps with Sarah. Um, we keep the talks fairly short. Uh, it's going to be around 20, 25 minutes or so. So ask lots of questions. We'll be around afterwards um, or even during. Uh, this is pre recorded and Sarah can probably answer some in chat during that. So feel free to submit them in the Q&A. Uh, if you have any problems, um, ask in the chat. We can try and get that going as well. And then um, at the very end, if um, you have some in-depth questions um, that aren't fully through Q&A, you can raise your hand and we can unmute you and we can chat a little bit more as well. Um, I also wanted to mention um, some of the other resources available at CMAS before we get started. So uh, if you're here, we have Beyond the Scope uh, discussion series, and there's quite a few that have been recorded as well. You can check out the CMAS YouTube page. Um, also, schedule one-on-one -on -one consultations with any of our instrument managers. You can talk to any of us. Um, and we are currently um, running samples on all the instruments. Um, or if you need any other help with remote assistance, you can contact CMAS as well. Um, so there's our instrument suite. Sarah's going to talk about sample prep, but we have quite a few instruments available that we'll be able to take advantage if you're able to get good samples. Um, if you talk to any microscopists, they'll say if you have a good sample, it'll work well. If you don't have a good sample, you're not going to get good data out of it. So sample preps definitely the most important part, but we also have a lot of different instrumentation available. So ranging from our newest uh, Themis Z probe corrected um, atomic resolution microscope, um, also a bunch of different microscopes for cryo imaging with Iglesias and Krios. We have a couple dual beam instruments for sample prep, um, as well as milling. Um, a lot of different SEM instruments as well, range from high resolution SEM to environmental SEMs and other capabilities, including X-ray, microtomography, XRD, among others. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start this. If you have questions during, you can ask there and we'll be available afterwards to chat. Hi, I'm Sarah Nicola, and I work at The Ohio State University at the Center for Electron Microscopy and Analysis. Um, I came here a couple years ago after spending a decade in Germany where I got really good at um, biological sample processing for electron microscopy, and I was really fortunate to have a chance to spend that time there. Um, so I'm happy to bring that expertise here. And today I'm going to discuss high pressure freezing. Um, and I'm pre recording this video because my internet at home sometimes inconveniently drops, and I thought it would be um, perhaps more uh, prudent to record this, but I am around to answer questions as part of our Beyond the Scope series. So save your questions till the end. Even though this is pre-recorded, I'm happy to have discussions when it's done. I will share my screen.
So I will be talking about high pressure freezing for a biological EM. That's me, that's where I work. It's also my job. This is an overview of the talk. First, I'm gonna discuss general biological EM sample preparation. And then we're gonna take a closer look at that first step of fixation because that's what high pressure freezing is most relevant for. We'll also discuss um, when you wanna use this and when you don't, and what steps are necessary to follow high pressure freezing with to not lose the benefits that you get from it. Um, and also if you're interested in high pressure freezing at OSU, feel free to contact me. My contact information will be on the slide at the end of the talk. Um, for biological samples, whether you're looking at um, thin sections prepared for TEM or transmission electron microscopy, or if you're looking at block face scanning electron microscopy, in either case, it relies on um, samples that have been stained and embedded. Even for SEM surface imaging, biological samples are often necessary to fix first. So for high pressure freezing, it's relevant for these steps, um, fixation obviously, but if you are going to do some end block staining, then you need to be kind of particular about how you follow high pressure freezing. So you need to take into consideration using freeze substitution as a way of um, getting rid of the ice without losing your ultrastructural preservation. Chemical fixation has been around for a very long time. This is the workhorse. This is when you don't high pressure freeze. <laughs> um, so it's very versatile, it's portable. You have many options for different chemicals. Even ethanol is a fixative, um, glutaraldehyde, formalin. It's used in high school science classes. You can take some fixative with you on a walk in the woods and drop some leaves in there and come back and the ultrastructure will look great. But it's not always ideal for some samples. In fact, um, during my time in Germany, I was um, part of a project to map the brain. And part of this is finding the connections between neurons. But unfortunately, conventional chemical fixation causes cellular swelling. And it, it doesn't necessarily rupture membranes, but it does make cells get pushed together. So if you, if you can avoid the cellular swelling artifact, it's much easier to find the contact points between cells and where they're actually signaling to one another. Um, chemical fixation also requires, it, it takes time. You need time for the chemical to infiltrate into the tissue. So if you're trying to fix a larger block, then it's not particularly useful, or if you're trying to fix something that's very dense. Um, another disadvantage of chemical fixation has to do with um, the, the preservation of the native state, because the way that chemical fixation works is it cross-links proteins to other proteins. And if you are trying to see one of the um, active sites or the linking sites of one of these proteins, you'll miss it because it will already be cross-linked to something else. This is um, antigen masking. If you plan to do any kind of immunological electron microscopy down the road, you want to stay away from anything that will cross-link your potential regions of interest or proteins that you're interested in. So chemical fixation is extremely useful, but like any tool, you don't want to use it for everything. Um, cryofixation is a very helpful alternative to chemical fixation. You don't need to cross-link proteins. Um, you can section directly after freezing tissue, and it's, it's not going to have fixation artifacts. M more on that in a moment, but it won't have chemical fixation artifacts. Um, the downsides are that if you take a piece of tissue and you put it in the freezer, it will develop ice. It will, it will develop crystalline ice. Crystalline ice will destroy the morphology of tissue on an ultrastructural level. Um, it, will, it will make it so that you cannot see your membranes intact from your original sample. So to help alleviate that damage, people will sometimes do a sucrose infiltration. Sugar sucrose is a cryoprotectant. Um, unfortunately, if you wanna take a tissue sample and you want to freeze it, you, 
how, how will it preserve its ultrastructural morphology during the freezing process if it's not already frozen or fixed? So if you want to do that, you need to then use a chemical fixative, and then we're back to um, chemical fixation artifacts. So to avoid ice damage, uh, this is where high pressure freezing comes in because, let me see, yes. So a high pressure freezer is a very handy tool that takes advantage of the fact that at increased pressures, ice will remain in a vitreous state as it's frozen at colder temperatures. You won't get crystalline ice formation until you um, either reduce your pressure or reduce your temperature beyond simply a frozen state. So a high pressure freezer will increase the pressure in a very small chamber in which your sample is while plunging it into liquid nitrogen. So most of your sample, sometimes not the center for a larger samples, but most of your sample will then be frozen in vitreous ice and you will not see crystalline ice damage. So this is an example of, um, hopefully you can see my, my pointer, but if you can't, bear with me. Um, so here in the first image, you see a, a carrier hat. Um, this is a, often made of brass. And in this bottom image, you can even see it sandwiched between two posts. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so your sample would sit inside this not very deep carrier. There's a side view to the right of it. Um, you can see clearly and probably also just have an intuitive sense that you're limited in sample size. It's very difficult to increase the pressure in a large chamber quickly. So the chamber needs to be kept very small. You put your sample in the center of it, you put this carrier hat sandwich or simply a single one, if you like, into this holder. And then you, um, I'm not sure if you can see, there is a small black tip to the screw inside this holder, that's sapphire. So it's extremely robust and it's a very hard material and it will not expand or contract easily even as it's frozen. Um, it's important to use fillers when you're loading this carrier hat because you don't want air pockets. Air will um, get easily compressed. You, you want to use a solid or a, something with more density than air, whether it's a liquid or a yeast paste or it's something like ESA. Um, you then put your sandwich together, put it in this holder, attach this holder to a, a white syringe looking post and put it into the machine. I have an image of it later. And it will increase the pressure to about, to over 2000 kilobar. And then it will drop the sample into liquid nitrogen, freezing it almost instantly. So this is another benefit to high pressure freezing is that if you're doing an experiment where you need to fix your sample at a very fine time scale, if you're looking at a process that only takes seconds to complete, high pressure freezing will allow you to say with much greater precision at what point your sample was fixed as opposed to chemical fixation, which can take minutes or possibly hours to come to completion. So high pressure freezing is very good for preserving ultrastructural detail, just like chemical fixation. Um, it does prevent chemical fixation artifacts and um, it allows you to preserve that extracellular space like I was talking about. The downsides are that you can only use very small samples. And when you do put your very small sample into this carrier disc, you need to do it quickly. So if you have excised a piece of tissue or if you have removed cells from their medium, then you need to get it from its happy state to its fixed state as soon as possible. And sometimes this can be very challenging. You don't get to rely on chemicals to fix your sample before you start messing with it. So it requires a lot of technical um, um, attention and manual expertise. Um, this was a handy figure that I found from Romero Bray 2015. And I like how this is shown. So while they talk about cell monolayers or cell pellets, you can also imagine this being done with a piece of tissue. Um, so in the top, it's simply, you have your cells, your samples, you fix it, you post fix it or also stain it. It's the same thing with heavy metals, dehydrate it, resin embed it, and then it's in a plastic block and you can take sections from it. 
So that's traditional chemical fixation. Um, cryofixation is where you, just under the B column, halfway down, you'll see that um, they take their cells and they put it inside a carrier hat. Or, sorry, they'll even grow this on sapphire disks. I didn't mention. Because sapphire is such a hard material and it won't um, flex or change its um, volume based on temperature, or at least not readily, um, you can use it on which to grow your cells directly and then put that whole disk inside the carrier. And then you can put that in the high pressure freezer. Um, you can also just take a pellet of cells and a transfer pipette, pipette some cells into that carrier and then put it in the high pressure freezer and follow it with either free substitution or you can see there is a line that goes below to cryo-electron microscopy visualization. Um, so you can take a look at your frozen cells. Um, alternatively, if you only have a single cell layer, you can just plunge freeze it. We'll talk about that more in a couple of slides. So free substitution, oh, we should talk about that. I have a slide on that too, right here. Um, so free substitution will take a sample. So your sample, once it's frozen in the high pressure freezer, it's in liquid nitrogen. So you want to get it from this the state where the morphology is relying on the cold temperature and the frozen state to, to keep stable. You want to take it from that state to a room temperature state. So you want to de-vitrify your sample at the same time that you're fixing it. So what you need to do is, is um, have a free substitution cocktail, it's often called. And this can be anything that doesn't freeze and that's tissue compatible at liquid nitrogen temperatures. So often acetone is used as a carrier solvent. And inside that acetone, you can mix glutaraldehyde or you can mix some osmium tetroxide, which is both a fixative and a staining agent. So through free substitution, you can either stain your sample or you can chemically fix it and bring it back to room temperature. On the right, you'll see these um, HM23, K11M, unacryl, low acryl, these, these are resins. So you can even embed samples. You can, you can put them in a frozen state with a high pressure freezer. And then while frozen, you can de-vitrify, fix and stain your sample and even get it into resin before it ever sees room temperature. Or you can mix your glutaraldehyde with your acetone and only fix it and then bring it to a room temperature state. Now, you might question why you would want to use chemical fixation if you've just gone to the trouble of high pressure freezing, because part of the, the joy of using high pressure freezing is to avoid chemical fixation. But um, you don't need to worry so much about the initial fixation artifacts if you do high pressure freezing first, because that cellular swelling will not happen. You've already fixed your sample. It's not going to move while it's frozen. And then the chemical fixatives will come in and keep it in that same state. So you'll see a much more um, biologically relevant sample by using high pressure freezing and then free substitution. Even if you bring your sample back up to room temperature in a fixed state and then do your staining and embedding. Um, high pressure freezing is, is ideal for samples that are notoriously difficult to fix due to um, having an outer shell or being very dense, like plant cell walls or bacteria can have very thick cell walls. Um, it's alternatively good for samples that might be too delicate for chemical fixation. For example, the, the fine DNA strands that grow in biofilms. Um, it's, there is some indication that um, these filaments are much better preserved in high pressure freezing than in um, chemical fixation. My own work was in the mouse retina, um, and I, I high pressure froze some retina samples, which was great because it's already in a, a single layer. It's already sheet-like, so you dissect it very quickly in bubble medium and then get it in the carrier and freeze it immediately, and you see much more round structures. I have some images for comparison in a moment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's not necessary to use high pressure freezing for cells that you've already grown on a grid. 
you can just plunge freeze those because they will freeze so quickly because it's such a thin sample that you won't see crystalline ice form anyway. It's also, so it's, um, it's unnecessary for samples that are extremely thin, like tens of microns thin. Um, it's also not good for samples thicker than 200 microns, so it has a, a limited sample size or a sample thickness. Um, thicker than 200 microns, and you can't get the pressure high enough in the carrier quickly enough uh, to prevent crystalline ice formation in the center of the sample. Some people don't care. They only want the edges of the sample to look at, and they don't care about the center of it. If you fall into that category, then it's fine to use high-pressure freezing for whatever samples you like. The carriers themselves, um, I believe they get to about 300 microns in depth. So if you take two of them and you make a sandwich, that's over half a millimeter. I think it's extremely likely that if you decide to prepare your sample that way, you will see ice crystal formation in the center of that sample. But if your sample is 600 microns and you don't care about the center of it, sure, go for it. Why not? Um, also, it's not good for samples that re require long dissection times just because it takes um, if it's going to take you time to get the sample from its living state to its fixed state, your, your ultrastructure is going to take a hit. This is an example that I really like. It shows exactly what I'm familiar with when it comes to high pressure freezing. So on the left is a classically fixed sample. Um, you'll see that the contrast is more intense and this is poorly understood but I believe it has to do with the fact that many fixatives are also osmophilic or um, they can behave as mordants um, or a heavy metal staining glue sort of. And you never quite rinse the whole thing out. Um, so this is one of the reasons for this excellent contrast that you see. Um, but you, you see that um, the inside of the cell on the left, this is intracellular because that M right there is a mitochondrion. So this is intracellular. It's washed out. And this is something that you will see. You can also see that the processes are not round. They're oddly shaped. They're almost polygons in some cases. This comes from cellular swelling and then getting fixed in that swollen state and then subsequently dehydrated, which causes cells to then swell and shrink again, which means that they're not always going to be pressed up against each other in their final state, but they're not going to be round. Um, in vivo, processes are much more likely to be round, which you see on the right. And these are beautiful processes. In fact, you can even see um, <clears throat> what looks like, to me, like a PSD in there, which is just gorgeous. Um, both of these samples, I would say, are well prepared. There might be just a bit of cherry picking because you don't always see this intracellular washing out with chemical fixation that we see on the left here, but I would say overall this is a very good comparison. Um, the future of high pressure freezing. So this is as cryo-electron microscopy grows in popularity. Um, <coughs> people are um, looking into how to take a, a sample and high pressure freeze it to preserve its native state and take it from that frozen state directly to a microscope. No freeze substitution, no staining, no chemical fixation, no embedding, anything. You just take the sample of a piece of tissue, and much in the same way that if you want to take a look at a plunge frozen grid and mill a thin lamella through a single cell, why not mill into a piece of tissue and get multiple cells in your sample? So this is, I think, where, where high pressure freezing is really going to make some strides, and I believe if I'm not mistaken, there are people in Germany and at the Max Planck Institute and the EMBL who are currently working on this, exactly. Um, also, people have found that by combining high pressure freezing and then chemically fixing, you can prevent, I'm sorry, I wrote staining artifacts. I should have written morphological artifacts. You, you can prevent these morphological cellular swellings and problems and myelin blebbing, for example, that you'll see with chemical fixation, but you'll still get that enhanced contrast that we saw in the previous image. Also for um, correlated light and electron microscopy, high pressure freezing can contribute. So this is something right now that I think has been commonly pursued with cells grown on grids. You can grow fluorescent cells on a grid, image it in a light microscope, plunge it, 
and take your electron microscopy images from it, there's no reason that you can't do the same thing with a larger sample or a piece of tissue. Um, if you're interested in using high pressure freezing, this image did not come from CMAS um, because I am not there to take a picture, but this is the instrument that we have. Um, if you're interested in using it, please email me. My email address is on the slide. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to take them. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen.